Welcome back to Definitely Not Definitive. I'm Ken. And I'm Bethany. And we're just a fantastic couple in love that loves reacting to some Fallout. Yes, we do. And so we're checking out uh, season two, episodes seven and eight of the Storyteller series for Fallout uh, by ShoddyCast. And this is uh, the Forced Evolutionary Virus. Ooh. Fun times. Okay. And Gary from Vault 108. Good old Gary. Yeah, Gary. The guy's... From Vault 108. The guys that all look like each other. They're all called Gary. I think they all look alike. And... Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. I think, yeah, I think we know Vault 108 from uh, another Fallout video that we did, a uh, reaction that we saw um, from like the like the craziest vaults or whatever. Um, yeah, but you can check that all out in the description of this video. We got a playlist for all of our Fallout reactions. Yeah, we do. Ready? No. Mm. He forgets I forgot every this time. single time. Not every, I, the last couple times I remembered, but the, yeah, I, I forgot. We can't do Fallout without our Fallout drink, which is the Stimpak Spritzer yep. because it has a Stimpak. So you add that and you stir it around. And now you can be, what, what, Cheers. what's the word? Revitalized. Oh, revitalized, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. In California, a ways east of the Pacific coast are the remains of a town once called Mariposa. There's a military base outside the town, little more than a hole in the ground these days, but it has played a pivotal role in the wasteland's destiny time and time again. I know most of you were born there, or reborn, but Marcus tells me that some of you are having trouble remembering things. Yeah. You can't always <laughs> figure grunt. out what's real and what's not, so I'm here to give you all a refresher course in mutant history. <laughs> you talk a lot! Sound funny when you talk like a stupid human! <laughs> <laughs> Yes, as I was saying, <laughs> I visited the Mariposa base a few years ago. There was little more than the bones of a few dead super mutants, deformed rats, and the skeleton of some old dog lying next to a broken down force field generator. But deeper down, much deeper, I saw firsthand the secrets that spawned both the super mutants and the Brotherhood of Steel. Back before the Great War, the facility was used to experiment with the forced evolutionary virus. The big vats are destroyed now, but you can still find some of it deep below the ground. Long before the Master came, the FEV was created by the United States government in an attempt to generate useful mutations. The government used its own citizens as guinea pigs, prisoners and commie sympathizers, but Americans nonetheless. Captain Roger Maxson, the founder of the Brotherhood, was stationed there before the war, a simple hmm. soldier in the security detail. But when men under his command found out what the scientists were doing to his comrades in arms, they rebelled, yep. and Maxson soon became their leader. Eventually, they became the first members of the Brotherhood of Steel. When the nuclear holocaust took place a few days later, Maxson led his soldiers and their families out into the wasteland leaving the Mariposa base behind. They sealed the place up as best they could and activated automated security measures, but with no one on hand to maintain it all, eventually people and critters made their way inside. <laughs> the pre-war scientists never quite succeeded with their experiments. It took a more advanced mind to control the effects of FEV mutation. Decades after the Great War, the future master fell into those vats and when he emerged, he picked up where they left off and eventually created most of you. Then the vault dweller located the place and... <laughs> I'm so sorry. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> she apologized, I'm so sorry. Long dead. <laughs> yes, too fun. Most people never knew of the base's existence in the years afterwards, but the Enclave had the resources to locate the origins of the FEV they went to Mariposa to secure a sample for their own devious purposes. The Enclave kept their soldiers and scientists protected from the FEV, but their slave laborers, miners kidnapped from the town of Redding to excavate the lower levels, had no such protection from the goo that survived the decades. Slowly, those poor workers began to mutate. Sadly, that second generation of super mutants didn't have the master guiding their transformation. He had carefully chosen his subjects before dipping them, but this second generation was composed of anyone unfortunate enough to be pressed into the Enclave service. 
The results were mixed. The second generation was as big, sometimes even bigger, but much less intelligent. That's why some super mutants in New California can get along with humans, while others are. <laughs> in fact, some of the original super mutants even call the second generation dum dums. <laughs> Stupid robot! <laughs> But a few of this new batch ended up developing abilities that would have made the master proud. Silly robot! <laughs> He's a scared robot. Freaking him out. When the He's Chosen One was searching for the Enclave's headquarters 40 years ago, they stumbled across the Mariposa base and discovered some second generation mutants still trapped inside after the Enclave blasted the entrance. The Chosen One fought a mutant named Melchior who could summon creatures out of the FEV goo, just like a magician pulling Tanny. rabbits out of a glowing green hat. At least, that's what the Chosen One claimed. No one back then was keen on inspecting the place firsthand to verify a story about magical death claws. Only person who seemed to care what happened to the miners from Redding was Melchior's son, Junior. He was just a tyke when his dad disappeared. If he's still alive, he'd be middle-aged about now. Maybe still wandering the wasteland looking for his dad. Since then, Marcus has done his best to give some of you a home. Among the mutants, every person is their own unique being, a species of one. That kind of genetic diversity is a blessing. There are places in the wasteland where the opposite is true. Dozens of identical men caged together, consumed by a murderous rage against all outsiders. But that Gary is a Gary. story for another day. Did you hear him say Gary? I, <laughs> I like the way that this was uh, laid out this time because he was like talking to the mutants and like telling them about their uh, history. I thought that was a cool, uh, cool detail. Yeah, and even the way it opened, I was thinking like, I want a mutant history lesson. <laughs> now, of course, my brain was kind of going to X Men for some reason <laughs> rather than like these nuclear mutants. Um, but yeah, I thought the way this was done was great. I love the humorous moment between the robot and the mutant mm -hmm. and the humorous moment of how how some of the mutants were were great and intelligent and got along with people and how others were, and it just pans to the mutant chasing <laughs> yeah. like the ram that's randomly <laughs> running through the area. Um, so I, I thought they did a really good job with this and it was surprisingly lighthearted considering mm -hmm. how so much of the fallout content and and rightfully so for a nuclear apocalypse is pretty dark and depressing <laughs> give me something for them to fight other than yes other than you you mean hey yeah. bucky what's this dill raptor oh, dill raptor a, oh it's a string let's check out gary in a world ruled by swords sorcery <laughs> and savages this is a trailer one man became a legend you know we're... from the pages of the world's <laughs> yep. most popular comic book to the screen of your local drive-in comes Grognak, a warrior <laughs> from the land of prehistoric i think so i think he's supposed to look like an adventure beyond your wildest fantasies warrior oh warrior Conqueror. <laughs> he is Conqueror. Grognak the Barbarian, featuring Zane Valoric as Copocalypse, Vera Keys as Femra, and introducing Howard Braunschweiger as Grognak the Barbarian. <laughs> Coming to a theater near you, Thanksgiving weekend 2077. When the apocalypse was on the horizon, people became desperate to preserve civilization. For people who survived Armageddon inside a vault, life became an exercise in maintaining the status quo as much as possible for as long as possible. Everyone was expected to do their part to keep the vault running until the time came for those doors to roll open. It wasn't a life for rebels. Tunnel In some things. vaults, there was so much conformity that they were all practically clones. The creatures and the one vault ended up being literally full of clones. Yes, pre-war society had cloning technology, but it wasn't used much. At least two vault tech facilities had it, though. 
Vault City was built by the inhabitants of Vault 8, and they used their cloning lab to create replacement organs and limbs for the injured and sick. That sort Please of mark. miraculous medical technology helped Vault City become a major power in Northern California. Yeah. But another vault out east had the most advanced cloning lab in the world. They could create a perfect copy of an adult human. Well, almost perfect. Spaz. Yeah. Vault 108 had some exceptional geneticists in their midst and a fully stocked cloning lab. But cloning is a tricky business and reproducing every single atom in a strand of DNA without error was tricky even for the finest minds of the pre-war era. Under the right conditions, they might have been able to populate their vault with an endless supply of cloned citizens. But it turns out that the good people of Vault 108 were the butt of one of Vault Tech's little jokes. Their overseer was terminally ill at the time of the Great War, Oh, no. He'd been selected for the job specifically so that the vault would suffer a sudden, inevitable loss of leadership. Perhaps the cloning efforts were somehow intended to compensate for their lack of leadership. Maybe they wanted to create fully formed adults in a lab and skip the difficulties of raising children. Whatever the reason, the leaders of Vault 108 decided to make extra copies of some guy. I don't <coughs> think there was anything Just special about the man they picked. Just a random occupant of the vault as a test subject. Logs on the vault computer network indicate that they made at least 54 copies of the guy. Damn. Due to some unknown flaw in the process, each clone was completely hostile to any non clone he met. Hmm. Interesting. They still kept cranking out new clones, and eventually they had an army of identical madmen imprisoned. And when they tried to dispose of them, they started running amok in their vault. There aren't any records about what happened next, but it's safe to Pretty assume sure that the clones wiped out their makers and yeah. shut themselves in. The doors to Vault 108 were open, and at least one of them was taken out of there. I saw his body in what was once Virginia, Bailey's Crossroads. Ooh. It's been a while since I've been to Vault 108. It's where I found this little knickknack. I don't know what it is about these things, but I swear I'm somehow compelled to collect every last one. <laughs> anyway, Vault 108 is still out there. And it's filled with a pack of interchangeable lunatics calling out the one word they all know how to speak. Their own name. Larry. No, wait. I think it was Harry. Barry? Gary? Yep, that was it. You know, just north of that vault full of Garys, there's a town that had another pair of lunatics in it. Two dandies who pretended they were real-life superheroes. One of them even dressed like a villain from the old Grognak comics. <laughs> but that is a nice. story for another day. What Come on, Edna. We got a big wasteland to explore. Gary. Um... Uh, Gary? Gary? <laughs> Gary? Oh. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Better be freaked out. Gary? <laughs> Gary? 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 I mean, it's basically like I am Groot. No, it is definitely not like I am Groot. It is much freakier than I am Groot. Yeah, no, no. It's definitely freakier, but I'm saying like the concept wise. All Groot says is, I am Groot, but it mm -hmm. carries different meanings. All they say is Gary, but I assume it carries different meanings. Yeah, it does. I like that the fact that, uh, that he's searching for the name and the guy says Gary, because that's all he can, uh, can say. Uh, that was a fun ending for that one. Um, and a fun concept for the for the vault itself. Uh, I think uh, when we last checked it out, uh, the different vaults and like this came up. I think that's the reason I remembered it, because I really like this vault idea. Yeah, nothing like putting in a bunch of people with a leader that's about to die and a cloning ability for psychopaths. That's definitely that you you like this, huh? Yeah, but they all they, they all say they can only say Gary and they're just like super violent towards anybody that's not a, a clone named Gary. Creepy. Um and I love the humor at the end with the robot. Yeah, the humor the the robot again is a good uh addition to this series um to have like the storyteller uh be with uh, Edna and um and also give like another like a little bit of a of a personality as well. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think a lot of Destiny. Like it, we have our oh, our, ghost, yeah. our space guy and his ghost. 
Only he happens to be not a ghost. He's Edna, but still. Yeah. It applies. Let us know what you thought about this down below in the comments. And if you want uh, all of our Fallout reactions, check out the description of this video. We got a playlist there for you, as well as a link to our Patreon, where you can get early ad-free access to our videos and our reactions. Yeah. Thanks so much for checking out our reaction to uh, Fallout Season 2, Episode 7 and 8, which keep mine. That our reaction is definitely not definitive.